August Gale is a story of two storms. One storm is about a hurricane that roared up the coast in 1935 and headed straight for Newfoundland, um, where my ancestors lived in this fishing village. And during that time period, these men sailed in 15-foot dories and schooners that were maybe 40 to 60 feet. They had no warning of this devil, as they called it, as it came up the coast. And this fishing village where my grandfather was born, uh, 300 people on the south side of Marystown lost. Um, there were 42 children out of this community that lost their fathers, so it was devastating to them. And the other part of the storm is my grandfather. He um, moved to Staten Island and later abandoned my father, my nana, and my uncle twice. So growing up, I never knew anything about him um, because my father refused to talk about him. So the book alternates between the real storm in 1935 and my grandfather, who created his own storms. I wrote this book because um, after I saw the movie The Perfect Storm, I sat in the theater and that movie just resonated with me. I'm Irish, I, I'm connected to the water, and I just sat there after being a journalist for 30 years. I said, I can do that. And two years later, when I talked to my father, and I said, Dad, I wanna write books. And he said, what kind? And I said, sort of like the perfect storm. He said, you have a story like that in your family. And then he starts telling me about this August gale that killed several of our ancestors in this tiny Newfoundland village. And all he knew was that potentially, you know, Captain Patty, who was great uncle, was lashed to the wheel, and many of them died. And I was just like, wow, it's a great story. And then he tells me another piece about my grandfather, the man I never knew, who at the time had immigrated to Staten Island. And a few days after the gale, a newspaper is swirling around his feet. And so he picks up the headline and he reads 40 Newfoundland fishermen killed in August gale. He knows all of his family is out in that storm and he just loses it and becomes hysterical. Um, so my father tells me these two pieces and then he says, maybe we can get in touch with family. And I'm thinking family, Ambrose's family. I never knew anything about Ambrose um, because he abandoned my dad and my dad refused to talk about him. So on this night in my home in Maine, I dream of giant waves and a grandfather I'd never met. And that began our research into the August Gale. Um, and I spent nine years off and on, because I work full time as a journalist, researching. Um, my dad and I and my sister traveled to Newfoundland to interview the survivors, um, people who lost their dads in the storm. We interviewed people who remembered the gale and what it did to that community. So it was, um, the research was incredible because it was, it was, you know, the priest maid who remembered, you know, the priest going door to door to tell all these families, you've lost a son, you've lost a husband, you've lost three sons and one husband. Um, so it was just a, an event in their lives that was sort of like their 9-11. It was a natural disaster that took all of their fathers away. Um, and the other piece during that trip is learning about my grandfather. I mean, I'd never seen a picture of him. And my father was very ambivalent about going to Newfoundland. But I was like, Dad, we need to research the storm. But as we approach the rock, Newfoundland as it's called, because it's just this glacier scraped you know, island, I looked out and I was just overwhelmed at the emotion of coming to this island where my ancestors had lived and my grandfather was born. And I turned to my dad and I said, did you ever think you know, you'd be going to Newfoundland. And he said, not in a million years. And I was terrified because I thought, what is this trip going to be like for him? Is it going to be, you know, really emotional? And it was in part. I mean, we were meeting people that kept saying, you know, your father was a great man. And my dad would say, well, he deserted us. So it was kind of a, a mixture of emotion. Um, but the good piece, uh, we interviewed so many of these um, Marystown uh, men and women who remembered that storm and remember the night it came. And, and many of them saw spirits. I mean, they saw spirits. Um, they're all very Irish, the Newfoundlanders. They come over from Ireland. So they're superstitious. Um, the night of the gale, many of them saw their fathers um, who returned to their homes. Um, so it was, it was a very interesting story to, to interview them and then interview some of the fishermen. They're out in the gale. Um, and as these waves rose from 40 to 60 and 80 feet,
they were tied to the rigging and just praying, you know, let us get home. And a few of them did. Many of them did not. So um, it was just a story that resonated, like I say, because of my Irish background. But the families were so grateful because um, no one had told the story for them. Um, now this, this book has brought me together with my Newfoundland family that I never knew existed. Um, and often, many of these people are, they're all cousins, we're all related. Um, but it was also fascinating to learn about Captain Patty, who was my great uncle. He was a legendary fisherman, and he had never lost a man in 25 years. Um, he was fearless. Uh, many of the Irish Catholic fishermen would go to sea with their crosses, their palm fronds, their holy water, and as the waves would rise, they would throw this into the sea. Well, Captain Patty would climb to the top of the rigging and shout to God in the middle of a storm, I'm not afraid of you. So the, the Catholic fishermen would be like, Patty, get down, you know, we're all gonna die. But he was uh, known for bringing home the most cod. And so in this storm, People could not believe that Patty did not make it home. Um, and during the storm, they all feared the August hurricanes because it was the start of the hurricane season. And the night before Patty set sail, his wife Lillian said, please, Patty, don't go. Because not only was Patty going to sea, he was taking his 12-year-old Fra son Frankie, his 14-year-old son Jerome, and Patty's eldest son James was on another schooner. So during this storm, Patty is out to sea with his three sons. Um, and there's a scene in the book, and, and this is all true, you know, researched. Patty was last seen in a dory as the waves are rising. And another skipper is saying, what are you doing, Patty? There's a devil coming. And Patty says, I know, but we've got a stray dory. Patty was looking for his son, Jerome. Meanwhile, he knows his son Frankie's on board the schooner terrified, and his eldest son James is captaining a schooner for the first time. So it's just, you know, these incredible scenes um, and the research. I was really fortunate that many people uh, had memories and had witnessed certain parts of the storm and could help me recreate, you know, having seen Patty um, or, you know, having seen the priest uh, who had a knock on all these doors. Um, and let the families know, you know, your father's not coming home. So it was an incredible piece of history for me because as a journalist, I've interviewed many different people for stories, um, but this was my family. This was probably the hardest story I've ever written about because I was related to everyone. Uh, not only the Newfoundlanders who died in the storm, but my grandfather um, and one of the toughest pieces, I did not want to tell the story of my grandfather. I wanted to tell the story about the storm because that was compelling and, you know, my grandfather was, was digging up too much um, pain in my father's childhood. So originally I said, I'm not going to tell that part of the story, but it was like my grandfather was pushing his way in. And finally I said, Dad, I have to tell Ambrose's story too. And he said, it's okay, I trust you. And it's funny because a lot of the people that read it, they'll say, well, Ambrose, he was a bastard. And I'll say, no, he made some bad choices. He wasn't a bad man. And it's interesting, after I won the Pulitzer for the Willie Horton story on my, my newspaper, you know, we won the Pulitzer, he knew about that. My nana used to write him. And he said, I wonder if my journalist granddaughter will come find me. And I did, only many years later after he had died. So I feel like I, I've gotten to know my grandfather and he, there were good things about him. You know, he never deserted his second family. He was a hard worker uh, during the war. He worked in Brooklyn, you know, helping repair the victory ships. And um, so he was, you know, a hard worker many times and he loved his children. He kept um, the picture of my father and my uncle when they were young in his wallet. He had paintings of them in his closet. And when his second family would say, who are those boys? He could never talk about it. They were the secret boys that, you know, later in life they learned about. But I think he always regretted what he did. Why did he leave? Why did he run? Well, he met another woman um, and got her pregnant. And so in the middle of night in Brooklyn, he packed up this baby. He snuck out of his house and left my father who was at the time 11, 
My uncle was about a year and my Nana closed the door, stole my aunt's car and a thousand dollars from a paint job he, he would never do and drove away with his mistress and this baby that was just born and then made his way to San Francisco and then decided, oh, I miss my family and calls them out again only to leave them again, get the mistress pregnant again and my Nana had a nervous breakdown there. So that was the part my father could not forgive. You know, you abandoned us once, but why did you call us out to San Francisco? Um, and my father, you know, I think the book too, is it's been some healing for my father. Um, he would never, if someone said Ambrose's name, he left the room. Uh, he would not talk about him. So this book, suddenly, you know, my father's story is out there. And uh, I think it's been good for him. I think, um, the story of forgiveness, um, the story of the sea, uh, of realizing, um, you know, in the, when they were fighting this storm at sea, the courage of these, you know, it's, it's a time gone by. I mean, there's still fishermen that go out, but I think these people, the historical piece, it was a very difficult time. Um, they barely survived when they came home with cod and they were so hardworking. I mean, they just never gave up. Uh, the women, you know, would raise their children in a much simpler way. I mean, they, you know, had gardens. And um, so I think for me, it, it's the courage and integrity of these people um, that we can all learn from. I mean, they, they worked very hard to survive. And a lot of times the women lost their men and they still had to carry on. Um, and the government wasn't there to help them. And today a lot of people say the government helps too much. I mean, these people, you know, they survived on their own. Um, they're very hardworking. And I think too with family, um, that connection to family. Newfoundlanders, uh, so um, family means more than anything to them. And I think that's such a great, uh, you know, value. Growing up, my father, despite being abandoned, he always said to us, there's nothing more important than family. And I think that's because he knew his father abandoned him. And Newfoundlanders, I mean, if you're their cousin, uh, they can't do enough for you. So uh, for me, the piece is as well. I mean, there's nothing more important than family. And I learned that through this book um, in many ways.